Jack Powers with another episode of Infamous Federal Prisoners. And today we want to talk about a fellow that everybody in America and probably the world has heard about in some way or another. It's, his name is Sammy the Bull Gravano. Now, first of all, I'd like to talk about where Sammy got his nickname, The Bull, because, well, a lot of people just don't know where that came from. It wasn't because he was bullheaded or because he was bullish around the place or, you know, tried to get his way. Probably all that's true, but it's basically because he snorts. He snorts, like, out his nose to clear his sinuses um, like a bull. A bull snorts through its nostrils, and he sort of does that. It's a habit of his. Now, I met Sammy the Bull back in 1996, very briefly. It was at the unit for Witsec prisoners in an undisclosed location. Um, I mean, I can tell you where it is. It's, it doesn't matter. I mean, but I'm not trying to throw things out there. But the Bureau of Prisons, the Federal Bureau of Prisons has certain prisons. They're their units. They're independent little prisons off to the side that are designated for what they call prisoner slash or dash witnesses, which is tantamount to WITSEC, but you're, you're in prison. So in those little places, there's about 60 or 70 cells Usually you're gonna be doubled up. Uh, you know, TVs in the cells. You know, they used to be nice places way back in the day. You could wear your own clothes. You could have packages sent in. You could purchase whatever you wanted just about. Guys had all kinds of stuff in there. But then they did away with all that about 1996, 97. They did away with everything. They said, okay, we're gonna take everything. You guys gotta send your musical instruments home, any personal property that isn't BOP approved or on the list. So, and you can't wear your own clothes anymore. They just took everything away, immediately almost. So, you know, you can make phone calls at government expense, like five a week to your family and so forth. It's on an FTS line, federal telephone, service or whatever and so I'm at this unit and uh, I just got there and there's a guy walking around with a towel around his neck and they tell me that that's Sammy the Bull uh, and I'm like okay so what else um, but I didn't know him that well. I wasn't up close to him like friends or anything. Um, only observed him for a short time because I moved out relatively quickly. Um, he just seemed to be seemed to be really arrogant. Like most of those mob guys are very arrogant, very arrogant, especially when they decide to flip. Um, you know, I've seen them many times, like, tell the unit officers or the staff or even FBI agents or whoever's the case agent, I've heard them tell them straight out, this is what you're gonna do. And they get catered to Back then there was the witness uh, voucher uh, scam going on. So these guys would collect, you know, 
maybe a couple grand a month the FBI could pay them just by submitting these witness vouchers. It was all a fraudulent thing, but they'd submit these vouchers and then take the cash and turn it into money orders and send the money orders to their prison account. And in some cases, it became a little bit of a laundering operation. And the Bureau of Prisons and U.S. Marshals, because U.S. Marshals really runs it. It's not, it's Bureau of Prisons, but the Bureau of Prisons for WITSEC or witness prisoners, that's under the U.S. Marshals. The Bureau of Prisons just facilitates for the U.S. Marshal Service. In theory, anyway. I was kicked out um, in 1997 or whatever it was, I was kicked out um, because there was a lot of things going on that didn't set right with me and um, I was talking about it, telling people in the media about some of this stuff so they, they gave me the boot, kicked me out. Um, and that was the end of that but when I was there I saw all these mobster guys that have flipped and here's what happens I mean it's it's this is just the pattern right these guys they get in really deep 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 but they know that they have a ticket out the deeper they're in the bigger that ticket is, the more it's worth to the feds. The more they know, the higher up on the hierarchy they are, uh, the more pull they're gonna get, the more play they're gonna get with the feds. So they know that if they get to the spot where it's impossible, where things aren't working out, where they're either gonna get whacked or they're going to end up doing the rest of their life, rest of their days in a solitary, lonely concrete and steel cell somewhere in the federal prison system, they'll flip. It's a bunch of them, bunch of them. Hardcore, solid, yeah, stand up, MFers, right? Nah, this happens everywhere. AB, I don't care who it is, uh, DC, Blacks, ABs, whoever it is, whatever gang, whatever association, whatever organization, the mob, the mafia, they always flip. Somebody always flips. Just the way things go. So, same with the bull guy, the place where he was caught between a rock and a hard place. And he, he's not a dumb dude. He's you know, he's an opportunist. He's cagey, smart, street smart, savvy, knows how to manipulate, move. So he saw the writing on the wall and he said, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to pull this trigger. And once one of them decides to pull the trigger, that's it. I mean, they know that. They know that that's their ticket out so to speak not just out the door but out of that lifestyle i don't think anybody i really don't think they like that lifestyle who could who could like the lifestyle of always having to look over your shoulder always having some kind of conflict always being in danger of being arrested and imprisoned um always in danger of losing everything for what just so you can hold some kind of status amongst a certain slim segment of the population and say, hey, I'm, I'm this or I'm that. I'm, I'm a shot caller, I'm a gang leader, I'm a drug lord, I'm a, I'm a mafioso. You know, it's kind of like, okay. So what? This is how it is in a lot of the neighborhoods in New York. Chicago, Philadelphia, all over, any big city. There's neighborhoods that are very close-knit, 
practically everybody knows everybody in those neighborhoods and they have a vein of I don't know if you want to call it organized crime I don't know what organized crime is I would just call it a vein of characters who act out criminal who see an opportunity and they think that it's easy money they think that it's another kind of a merit badge I guess probably a bad analogy merit badge but um, they think that it gives them some kind of status standing um, and really I think most of these guys are afraid I think they're brought up in these neighborhoods they're brought up in this environment where yeah it's all like supposed to be the way it is it's the way you come up so to speak I don't think a lot of them like it I think a lot of them just get tired of it want out of it they don't know any other way than to flip and they flip a bunch of them flip there's so many flippers it's but that's the way it is with, with all of them. So Sammy the Bull, um, you know, he saw his opportunity, his grand opportunity, and his loyalty to Gotti was non-existent. Sammy the Bull, I'll tell you this, he doesn't have loyalty to anyone except himself. Now, he'll argue, he'll say, no, my family uh, comes first, but that's not true. Sammy the Bull is probably like, pretty much like the rest of us in certain ways. But yeah, it's not, he didn't have any loyalty toward Gotti whatsoever. Zero. In fact, he didn't like Gotti. He thought Gotti was somebody that he was superior to. He himself, Sammy the Bull, was superior to John Gotti and he wanted the lead um, but he couldn't get that because of the way things shook out but Sammy the Bull would have clocked would have whacked Gotti there's no question about it no doubt none he would have done that he was that type of guy you see these guys that are climbing the ladder um, they're vicious and they're ruthless and they're going to do whatever it takes in their own mind to get to the top and in the mafia that's knocking out the guy that's already at the top that's how that goes it's been that way historically since the beginning of the mafia you knock the top guy out and the next guy moves up so that's where the same the boat was and since he couldn't knock him out knock him out of the box then he went ahead and did it another way he flipped so then he had to come to grips or come to terms with the fact that you know, everybody now thought of him as a rat but he didn't care about that either his attitude he didn't care about all that that wasn't anything to him um and the fact is that he was also um, going to manipulate whatever was available, available to him to manipulate. FBI, the WITSEC program, um, they put him in Phoenix, Arizona. That's where he wanted to go, Phoenix. A lot of people want to go to Phoenix. It's a nice place, warm. Um, you know, it's where they want to relocate, somewhere around there. So, you know, they probably did give him money every month while he was in, they took care of his family. They Now, I'll tell you the other thing about this, though, is that from the side of law enforcement, they despise people like Sammy the Bull Gravano. They despise them. They can't stand them, but they need them. They need them in order to make the cases, in order to get the convictions, in order to 
do their jobs and make themselves look good, they need them. So they put up this little facade, like they're going to capitulate to their demands and their wants and desires. And, and then every chance they get, they're gonna sting them. They're gonna, they're gonna sabotage them. They're gonna, they're gonna make sure that at the end, they don't end up coming out ahead. Uh, if they can't, some guys do come out ahead. They get out of life. They go off into the WITSEC program and they're never heard from again. They become a welder up in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin or somewhere. And, you know, never heard from again. Just somebody in the neighborhood, somebody in an apartment just moved in and yeah, doesn't talk to people much. That's about it. So Sammy was down in Phoenix. He relocated there. I don't think they gave him outright witness protection on the streets. It's two different programs. One is for prisoners. One is for people that are in the community. And for prisoners, you have to change. You have to switch, transition from the prisoner wit witness program to the actual WITSEC program. And all of it, again, is run by the U.S. Marshals. So, um, you know, there's a lot of criteria for that. You have to do psychological evaluations, everything else. So, yeah, it's probably not, probably didn't come out well for him. They probably demurred, um, you know, decided to punt on that one. So, he probably didn't get it. But they probably helped him get set up in some way. They probably gave him some funds, probably gave him, you know, some kind of cover. Um, he can go back to him on and off. I guess in the early days he probably did, trying to get this or that. But, yeah, I mean, it's just the way people are. There's no glamour, there's no glory in being a thug, being mafioso, a hitman, a, a motorcycle gang member, or a drug lord, a, some kind of a shot caller or gang leader. There's, there's just no merit in it because you're wearing a target on your back, both from your underlings and from law enforcement and who do we know other than the politicians that's ever really been successful so having said all that I will end this segment and I will encourage you to purchase my books ADX Supermax the Alcatraz of the Rockies American Justice correcting its flaws there's pacing the cage there's lock and key there's the manual program, um, Jack Powers, Amazon.com. And this will help me to do the work that I want to do, just sort of to get the word out there, live my life, readjust to society, be as decent a human being as I can, and, and move on down the road. But I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.